Well, the idea of changing our brand from conservative and focusing on what we really are, Americans, is exactly the right thing to do. And I think it captures a lot more people. That, you know, conservative is such a turn-off word for so many people. You know, once upon a time, the word un-American was a word you did not use. But you can freely use it now because the other side wants yeah. to be un-American. Yeah. It's, it's not that they're, they're recoiling at being accused. George McGovern would wave the American flag because he loved America. Right. As radical as he was. Well. He was the most radical of them all. But he loved America. This radical left hates America. And, and they, they are run. You don't see the media research center in the end zone of an NFL stadium. You do see Black Lives Matter in the end zone of a stadium. They're the most powerful force in the world today, political force yeah. in the world today, run by Marxists with, 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 with a, a, a um, you know, policy statement that calls for the destruction of the nuclear family, which means the destruction of the West. This is their, this is their policy, not mine. Um, so and, it's right, and it's right there on the website. Yeah, Although, it's right there. It's their mission statement. Of course, they yeah. took it down. Yeah, but they, it's, they it's still it. well, up there. They still um, believe it. Hey, we got to talk about a book. Hmm? Your book. My book. <laughs> it's, this is a good one. This is. Uh, hey, Sarah's here. Sarah had some. Sarah, Hi, Sarah, Sarah took a look Hi. at the book. So, oh, what I, you, what I you, read what? it. It was terrific. And I think, aside from growing up of one of ten children, and your parents moving you out to a big mansion in the country, where near where we live. And obviously, there weren't good public schools. So without batting an eyelash, your father sent three boys off to boarding school in Spain yeah. when you didn't speak a word of English and expected, as Bozell's, you would thrive. And you did. It's unbelievable. And that's what your whole family kept doing things like that. We did all of our lives. You, you know, my father, my, mom, my mother, too, uh, challenged us yeah. in, in ways that people... People just don't get challenged anymore. No, no, you came um, from a very eccentric family. Eccentric we did. We loved it. We loved it. We loved being different. Well, it looks like they just turned you loose on 50 acres out there. Well, they turned us loose on an entire continent okay. when they sent my brothers <laughs> and me to Spain. <laughs> but they did, you know. You know, yeah. you, you just think about it today. Could, could something like this happen today? Sadly, no. no. But in, in 1973, it's, yeah. it's absolutely true. Yeah. But we we, we were asked so, to go to Spain. Sarah, you wanted to mention Terry Dolan, too, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah. I loved reading about your first job, political job, working for Terry Dolan. And I particularly like the sentence where he said, Brent, I think I'll put you in charge of fundraising. And what a... You'd never fundraised before. And who knew it was going to start your whole life? You know, yeah. what a good... Another time you've been thrown into the deep end of the pool. Well, yeah, I had to do that. But he's also, I mean, it's, it's very, very kind of sad. Um, this man is arguably, I believe, one of the two or three most important people in the modern conservative movement. And why do I say that? Because, because of, without him, there would have been no political machine in the United States House and Senate that would have enacted the Reagan Economic Recovery Program. We would not have had Reagan's program but for what this man did in electing and, most importantly, defeating the most powerful liberals in, in the Senate in 1980. And the sad thing is, I imagine 9 out of 10, maybe 99 out of 100 conservatives don't even know. No, who I, he never was. I, I didn't know he was. I didn't either. And he was so creative. I mean, oh, he, invented, yeah, he invented a whole way of being political. He, he, he was a genius. Yeah. It, 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 he came to the fore in 1976. He was 27 years old. And he took the position that if the Republican Party isn't going to do it, let's have the conservative movement do it, and it'll just follow us. And that was the beginning of the new right. And he and Richard Begri and Paul Weirich at Fulner. Uh, when was this? This was circa 1985? No, no, no. This would have been 19, 1976. 76, uh, where, where, okay. Where, where right. So this is, right, this is right at the beginning of the beginning, even right before Council beginning. of National Policy. And yeah. he, made yep. up, yeah. he made it up as they went along. It was he, incredible. He did. You know what? But he, he, he applied business principles to what he did. I'm going to get to him. Let's do, let's do a quick segment on him when we get in. Uh, sure. We gotta, we gotta, I guess we got to tape a show. The show all the show for March 17. Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists, and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics, and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. 
Welcome to the Bill Walton Show. I'm Bill Walton. Uh, we're here today to talk about a terrific book, uh, Stops Along the Way, A Catholic Soul, A Conservative Heart, An Irish Temper, and A Love of Life. And we're here to talk with its author, Brent Bozell. Uh, wh wh what can you say about L. Brent Bozell III? Lecturer, syndicated columnist, television commentator, debater, marketer, businessman, author, publisher, and activist. Uh, Brent is one of the most outspoken and effective national leaders in the conservative movement today. He's also a good friend. So, Brent, welcome. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, of course, we all know Brent founded and is president of the Media Research Center, the largest media watchdog organization in America. He started MRC in 1987, and since then, it's developed the largest video archive in the world. Uh, he also founded Newsbusters.org, CNSNews.com, MRC Business, MRC Culture, MRC TV, MRC Latino, and most recently, Free Speech America. Uh, MRC has nearly 600,000 members nationwide with over 12 million fans on Facebook and over 7 million video views per week online. So if that's not enough, Brent also in 1910 or 2010 founded For America, which has grown to over 7 million people on Facebook with the most engaged social media followers, followers in the conservative movement. Even the New York Times has declared For America was one of the greatest unexpected influences on the 2016 election. Brent, your resume is ex exhausting, but that's I've only got just sort of some of it. So anyway, I'm glad you're Well, you, you serve here. on our board, so you know, I, 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 you know, I get all the credit for things, but I always say, and you've heard me say it before, it's the boards and the staff of, of the organizations that make it happen. All the good CEOs say that. No, well, I'm, I mean it. I mean <laughs> I've it. Got, I've I mean done it. that once or twice. <laughs> they don't mean it. I do. So, so this is out of out of uh, this is a little different for you. Different approach to this. This is far more personal than your other books. What uh, what prompted? Uh... Well, I can, you know I could be flippant and say that this is what you do when you're on airplanes and uh, you're you're sick of watching the screen in front of you. Uh, I could be flippant and I could say my mother told me to write stories. Uh, but this is more serious than that. Um, I wanted to tell two broad stories. One was on, on life and through true stories, try to, uh, open up your mind to a world that once was and could be again. This is not supposed to be nostalgia. Oh, why in the good old days? That's not the purpose of this. This is the purpose is to make you think of the world of possibilities if we wanted it to be so. And how do you get there? The second part of it is more, more political. Uh, it, it is looking at some of the serious challenges, not facing um, so much this country, although I do get into that, but, but other nations that were fighting against communism and what they were going through to make people understand uh, the importance of liberty. And, I, and how this country ought never to take advantage of it because, you know, the old axiom, we're one generation away. Uh, well, we're one generation removed from what was an incredible struggle against communism. And with what's going on in Ukraine today, it's the same kind of totalitarianism coming from the same city with the same people in charge. They just don't call them communists anymore. So the... Family, the Bozell, the, the family Bozell. I mean, there's a Brent Bozell the third sitting right here. We have, but Brent Bozell Jr., your father was an extraordinary, uh, uh, at the beginning, founder of the modern conservative movement. Yeah. I mean, he, he, what, he went to, he was at Yale with uh, Bill Buckley. Yeah, they were roommates and best friends. And, and together they, they dominated the debate society. And I yeah. think your father won the national debate championship when he was in, in prep school. And, and yeah, yeah, it's, this is bragging time for me, but but I, I love it. Uh, no, he 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 got his uh, scholarship to Yale. Um, he bested a field of sixteen thousand um, in a national oratory contest, um, and then got him uh, his his. Uh, his um, scholarship, he was, he headed the debate team. Bill was his second. Bill 
ran the newspaper, and Bill and my father was did, his second. Did I hear that right? Bill Buckley was your father's second on the debate. He was not the starting. No, no, no. no. That's great. No, no, no. Uh, try being a son uh, raised by a father who had that kind of command. Uh, you couldn't pull anything off of him. Um, he, saw, he saw the world, Bill. He saw, he's one of those extraordinary people who saw everything through the lens of black and white. There was no gray matter. If things were right or things were wrong. And he wasn't passionate. He never raised his voice about anything. Things were quietly right. Things were quietly wrong. When he talked to you, it didn't matter who you were. You were going to speak in those terms to him or he was going to speak in those terms to you. You, you couldn't say anything, get anything by him because he saw the world that way. There are very few people in the world who, who can see things that way. He did. He... You all lived in Bethesda, and you had a pretty big place in Bethesda, but you'd sort of worn out your welcome in Bethesda. I really did. the 10 kids, it's sort of, you know. Oh, we were terrible. A, we were terrible. And maybe not for that reason, but for some other reasons. It was reasons. for that reason. We were terrible. Well, it's it, you've got you've got like about 80 pages in the book about that, which I think is really fun. And we got to talk about your smoking sure. habit. Sure. No, um, no, no, no. But he, you picked up, and he and he bought a place in is it now Huntley, Virginia? Huntley, Virginia. And it's a, it, it was an old estate, rather modern looking, actually mm -hmm. not not the old classic Southern estate, mm -hmm. but a rather beautiful stone place on 50, 60 acres. And mm -hmm. he picked everybody up and moved out there, and you lived out there for thirteen or fourteen years. Yeah, yeah. I mean that had to be. It was you know it was it was thrust into another world. We. Imagine, in 1964, uh, we, we go out to this hamlet. Huntley, this is Virginia. the world that once was. Yeah, this is the world that once was, uh, with warts. You know, it's it's yeah. not all good news and bad. It, it, there, there, there was some tough stuff, for example. Uh, and, and this is a true story. When we arrived in October of 1964 uh, into this house that had been uh, well, dilapidated, was was starting to fall apart, and, and, and we fixed it and saved it, uh, there was a, a diminutive black man in the great room, with you know, big, big empty great room, sweeping the floor. Uh, he had an old cap on. He had his constant um, uh, overalls, old overalls, boots, and a flannel shirt. This was his dress for as long as I knew him. My dad went up to him, and, and, and he said, who are you? And he said, my name's Douglas. And I was come with the place. <laughs> really? We we had just, for all intents and purposes, purchased Douglas, 1964. What we didn't know was over the hill, we also had purchased two tenant houses that came with the property. In it, there were two black families. One was a, a, a black family that was there for several years, and, and they finally left. Um, my dad let, let them live there. Another one was Douglas and his mother, Miss Gracie. The book, by the way, is dedicated to Douglas and Miss Gracie. They, he was 48, she was 70, looked 100, maybe 65, and she looked 100. She was old, grizzled, and rocked on a rocking chair, mostly deaf, missing most of her teeth, and we were madly in love with her. And the Bozell children would spend all their time in the Russell house, in their tenant house. Um, he became, uh, as, a, as a grandfather to us, um, he, he uh, lived for the rest of his life with us, um, died of cancer. Uh, but there's, there's this lovely story between uh, my dad and he, and this again, uh, a, a sign of the times. Douglas knew now, nothing. To set the stage, your father was a giant. He was 6'3", six, 6'4", six, yeah. towering figure, Lincoln-esque, yeah. I've heard. Yeah, and Lincoln. Douglas was 4'11". Yeah, oh, if, if that, 5'2", 5'2", on a good day, yeah. on a good day. So yeah, they, they were very different. Um, and, and, and my dad said to Douglas, well, I, I guess you work for me now. Well, Douglas, this is 1964, had no understanding of the concept of money, none. His whole life was spent on this property. On Saturdays, he would either go four miles west to Front Royal or to Flint Hill or eight miles east to Front Royal. And he would hitchhike. And the first car that would drive by would pick him up. And I'm, I, I, I'm, I said it in the book, and, and um, I'll just say it this way. Uh, he, all those people who picked him up had a nickname for him. He was the little N. 
That was what they called them, the little mm -hmm. N. And they stopped and they picked them up. This is 1964. We were there for about two or three weeks. And one day and one night in the great room, somebody yelled out, there's a fire. And we looked in the front yard, big cross on fire in our front yard. It was welcome to the neighborhood Catholics. People forget that the KKK don't like Catholics either. Um, we had that happen to us. It was a, a very different world. In any event, back to well, my Douglas. impression in the book was you didn't really see coloring. You just had oh. Douglas. You didn't. It was for you. Oh, it was none. yeah. Oh none. You didn't it, see it. It was it was none whatsoever. Um, no, none, none. Um, and and for if it was you know, uh, we came to find out who some of those people were who had burned that cross. Um, they were they were just good old boys in that area. Full disclosure, you know, my house is is in Virginia. It's yep. only about ten miles from there. So yep. you're gonna have to name names so I could be uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well yeah, but no, you know, you know what the sad thing is? The sad thing is that if you go to Rappahannock County today, you won't see a single black man there. It was maybe fifty fifty or mm -hmm. maybe sixty forty. Um, that's how many blacks lived there. We grew up with them. They were country folk. Um, they, they were poor white farmers and even poorer blacks. That's what you had in Rappahanna County. So there was a real bond there. But, you know, land prices went up. They sold their land. They went to Baltimore. And that was the end. It was very sad. To me, it's a tragic thing that in Rappahanna County, you don't see what was the bedrock. And I got to finish this story, though. When, uh, so my dad paid Douglas $50 a week. That just gave him cash. That was to go into town to buy his, his wine and, and drink with his friends. And he would come back and have a hangover, which he would nurse on Sundays and go back to work on Mondays. Nobody knew that my dad was doing the following. When Douglas was diagnosed with cancer about eight years later, my dad said to him, went to him and said, Douglas, you're now retired. And Douglas said, what was I going to do? And my dad handed him a bank book. Back then, you had bank books where you wrote things on, yeah, with, a, books, with yeah. a pencil, yeah. Yeah, and you had your savings. And my dad said, here's your <clears> savings <throat> account. Uh, it, I don't know how many thousand dollars in it, but I had thousands of dollars in there. My dad had been regularly putting money in a savings account for him, and he handed him his thousands of dollars. Douglas had no idea what to do with it. He came to me first, and he said, Massa Brent, I want to put you through law school. And then went to my brother, Massa Johnny, I want to put you through med school. And mm. he went, tried to give it to all of us. This is, I've never known a man with a greater heart than maybe my, maybe my dad, uh, but the two of them in different ways, the greatest hearts I've ever known. So your dad and your mom, mom was Pat Buckley. She was married to Bill Buckley. She was Bill Buckley's sister, rather. So yep. he, married, he married his debate partner's uh, sister. Uh, they and were, she, yeah. I believe, and in, in, in she introduced Bill to his future wife. This was very, very incestuous. Uh, I don't want to diverge. I've always wanted to get into the, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for an addendum. But, but your, your father and mother were both very, came from very sophisticated backgrounds. Your, your father's father had, had started a company called uh, Bozell Worldwide. It was Bozell and Jacobs that became Bozell <clears throat> Worldwide. Who coined which phrase? Oh, I'm forgetting it right now. Poor. Yeah. Oh wait, who we got? Yeah, Sarah, yeah, you do yeah, it. You yeah. tell us. Yeah, that was this. That was she's this. off. She's yeah. off my pork. pork the other the white, white meat. meat. Yep, that was this. And oh. they also coined Corinthian leather. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know that one. Yeah, Corinthian leather, leather. But it turns out that Corinthian leather was just the same as any other leather. It just there you go. <laughs> uh, that, you know, here, here's a remarkable thing about that. Um, Bozell was Presbyterian. My father was the convert. But my uh, my grandfather was Presbyterian. Uh, Jacobs was Jewish, and they worked in Omaha. He was the partner. Yep, they were. Okay. They were yeah, Jacobs did did the books. My father, well, my grandfather was the marketing guy. Jacobs, I never knew my grandfather. Jacobs' grandson told me at an awards thing where we met each other. He said that his grandfather told him that in over twenty five years of partnership together, that my grandfather never once asked to look at the books from Mr. Jacobs. That's how close the two of them were. And there's this story that is told that we, I read the article in the Omaha Press from 1930-something about how Mr. Bozell and Mr. Jacobs had a difference with the city council. They were seen entering town, city hall with pool sticks. They emerged, and they had their way. 
<laughs> well, suddenly, this is the Bill Walton Show. I'm here with Brent, the amazing Brent Bozell, and we're talking about a world that 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 once was. Uh, you're, so your grandfather wasn't good with money. Your father wasn't good with money. That's terrible. I've been on your board, though. Mm. Fortunately, you are, so that's good. I mean, you met you met uh, our, our guy, who, who Tommy Do Dolan. Gary mm, Dolan. And that, that's like a half a billion dollars later that you've raised. He, yeah, but that doesn't mean I know how to manage it. Okay, all right. Well, that's I, I, I turn want, it over to people I want to who know to what they're doing. Money management skills, because it's really interesting. He was out. He's in Bethesda. They're very sophisticated people. Decides they want to have a certain type of house. The only place they could find they could afford was in Huntley, but they had this grand estate. But they, had, your mother and your father, rec uh, commuted back into uh, D.C. Seventy miles each your way. Your mother got up at four thirty in the morning to go yeah. in. Seventy miles each way, and, and there was no Route sixty six. No, it, route was, 50. it was on Route uh, Route fifty, or either fifty or fifty five, two lane roads. Yeah, that you did if you got behind a logging truck. Um, it was longer. But you know, but then as Sarah mentioned, he he then lock, stock, and barrel picked up the family and moved to Spain several yeah. years later. You were you were in Huntley from. 65 until 70 70 through 76 i think it was 76. 76 77 when did yeah. when did you go to spain i went to spain in 73 but the first time we went was in 61 okay uh, while we were living still in maryland we went to 60 in 61 it's kind of re remarkable because in 1948 after the war he hitchhiked in spain and nobody went to spain because there was a worldwide uh, embargo against Spain because of what Spain did in yeah, the Second Franco, World War. Franco yeah, Franco Franco was a pariah, even though Franco Absolutely. was actually pretty good. And that's never, that's never, that's another topic for a whole show. I would never defend uh, fascism or Nazism, but you put the whole perspective together with the world, and he was a friend of the United States. Yeah. Put that aside. My dad went there in '48. We should do a show on that. We should. Franco is one of the most mis misrepresented, mis mischaracterized. Uh, figures in world history. The left has defined him terribly. But my dad went there and fell in love with Spain and returned 13 years later with eight children, met with a wife and eight children, Catholics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you only have five. <laughs> yeah, I only have five. Okay. But I have my 16th grandchild, so, okay. so I'm right. catching yeah. up. Um, <laughs> uh, no, we, we went in 1961. Um, and again, just a, 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 a bold move. This is a time, Bill, when you, in, in many places, you didn't have running water. Uh, uh, where, where oxen came up the hill, there wasn't homogenized milk. Uh, many places didn't have electricity at night. So that's where he took eight children to live for two years. Now, he found a villa, and the villa had servants, it had a driver, it had all those lovely things on the villa, but you still were restrained by the world that you were living around, the people in the Escorial, which is now, it, it was a completely unknown town. Uh, nobody in the world knew that this town existed today. It's one of the most popular was places. Was it in central Spain near Madrid? Central Spain, north, just north of, uh, of Madrid. Okay. About, about 45 yeah. minutes yeah. north of Madrid. It's got uh, uh, the, <clears throat> the, the monastery of, of the Escorial built by Philip II which is one of the largest, most impressive buildings in the world. Hmm. Uh, but nobody knew it was there because of the embargo. But my dad fell in love with it. So he brought the family there. We lived there for two years. That's where he wrote The Conscience of a Conservative. Um, from, from For Barry Goldwater. Yeah, yeah. He, he wrote it in 19 days. He thought it was terrible. Um, he gave away the paperback rights on it. Uh, the, the, that's the lore, uh, which would be typical for my father to give away We've the paperback. We've been talking about money management. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It'd be typical for him to give away the rights of a book that sold millions of copies. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did. So, what he was there at the founding in the in the sixties for many of this, and you were there in the by the time you were you became active when in seventy six when you when you went seventy eight seventy nine. Yeah. And what was your first job? It was with the National Conservative Political Action Committee. Um, I had a wife. I had two children. I had just come back from college um, to, to Virginia, and I needed a job. And I was offered a job as a fundraiser, uh, which I did not want to do. Uh, but when you're struggling, you're struggling. You do whatever you have to. Um, I not only found that I enjoyed it, and I was pretty good at it, uh, but it was more important than that. It... it 
And that, that position uh, gave me an opening to a whole new world because I was working underneath this young guy who was an absolute genius. He was just 29 at the time. Yeah, just absolute yeah. genius. <clears throat> um, he knew how to... Uh, 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 every, anyone in the movement can have a strength in polling and fundraising and strategy and advance work and speaking, whatever. He had them all. He was a genius on all fronts. And you, you, you looked at him in wonderment. And the best thing about him was, Bill, he had an extraordinary sense of humor. And he was always smiling on the inside where the left thought he was the meanest, vilest, you know, smoke coming out of his ears, horns and everything else. And the guy just chuckled back at the office. He was having so much fun at their expense. So I want to circle back also to, the, to your mother. I mean, I, one of the stories I read of was that your mother was attending a, a, a lecture at, at Catholic University, uh -huh. and the lecturer started... Can I let you finish yeah. the story? Yeah, it's very Buckley. This is Pat um, Buckley. She, she uh, uh, my mother it was Patricia Buckley. She went by Trish or Tish. And she was known to have an Irish temper, the sweetest, most angelic lady you would ever meet in your life. And ask anyone who's ever known my mother, and they will say that St. Teresa has nothing on her. Unless you rubbed her the wrong way. In which case... Be careful. Well, T. Grace Atkinson was this very loud, lesbian, militant, anti-Catholic going around the country saying that the Virgin Mary had been knocked up. Typical for the times, Catholic University <coughs> invited 1971. her. 1971. Yeah. Catholic yeah. University invited her to speak. A yeah. woman who goes around the country saying that the Virgin Mary has been, the Blessed Virgin Mary, has been knocked up. So my mother, so my father led a protest there and they were going to say a rosary and he had and there was a big group he put together to say a nonviolent rosary outside on their knees and they weren't going to protest they weren't going to disrupt it my mother told my dad she wanted to come my dad said no i don't trust you she <laughs> promised to obey true story and she participated in the rosary as my dad later said he turned at one point and my mother wasn't there she just simply got up, went inside, went up to the rectum, and slapped T. Grace Atkinson in the face and made national news. She was on t in Time Magazine the next week. Well, she also uh, captured what she thought T. Grace Atkinson was saying. She said, this is an illiterate harangue against the mystical body of Christ. Yeah. yeah. And it was. Yeah, it really was. And that's the way they spoke. Um, and and that's, that's what she believed. She didn't do that because she—I'm I'm kidding when I say anger— she didn't do it because she was angry. She did it because she believed it needed to be done. How do you resolve your own Catholicism with the libertarian political world and conservative political world, the born-again world? I mean, it seems like there are a lot of uh, swirling currents in that. And your father, at, at some point, your father, who admittedly had some health issues, which we can talk about or not, but he, he went he went very firmly radical Catholic. And in fact, at one point, repudiated his experiment, uh, repudiated the founding fathers, saying they, they shouldn't have built the city of man, they should have built the city of God. He couldn't reconcile, ultimately. And ultimately, for him, <clears throat> it was an either-or choice. And he chose Catholicism over it. Uh, it was difficult. In fact, it cost him a lot. Uh, it cost him his magazine, ultimately. And it so, cost his, his friendship with Buckley. Oh, gosh. It was, you know, these, they, they went And these from, two had been inseparable. Inseparable, best, best of friends in college. It was, um, it was, it was uh, uh, to make you weep what the two of them went through. Uh, tell you a personal story. When my father died, Bill called me the day before and said, you must call me the moment your dad passes. And I did. And he gasped and he hung up the phone and he went right to St. Patrick's. They were very close, the two of them. They were also intellectual giants. 
and neither one was willing to get off his pedestal. Um, they met quietly, they would meet for hours, and they would try and try and try, and they couldn't reconcile it. At the end of the day, my father, my, Bill believed you could reconcile libertarianism, you could, you could reconcile fusionism. Mm -hmm. My father, at the end of the day, couldn't, because my father, at, at the end of the day, and it was the Nixon administration that really broke him away, and it was Claire Booth Luce writing in National Review that maybe uh, conservatives needed to rethink abortion. And that was pretty much it uh, for, for my father. Uh, well, Buckley did something similar. Well, Buckley in, uh, uh, came out in favor of birth control. That's it. Uh, and, and, and for, for a, a Catholic, uh, uh, from my father's worldview, that is ground zero. Um, when, when, if, you believe, <clears throat> if you believe that is a potential of a soul to go to heaven and you get in the way of, of, of a potential of a soul going to heaven, uh, then that is a terrible sin. That's how my father viewed it. Bill saw that it wasn't. He didn't see it as, as uh, uh, that way. And that was one of the, the, the distinctions. Bill was also a very strong Catholic. Uh, this is why, you know, they weren't poles apart. That's the, I wish they'd been poles apart. It'd be easier. They were so close. Yet on, on, on that, that 5% that they disagreed on, that ruined everything. For the two of them. Now, my dad, in time, because of his health issues, my dad was, you know, I, I write about this in the book. And, and, and He was bipolar. Bipolar. He was diagnosed as bipolar in 1976. He'd always been eccentric and with an eccentricity that we loved, uh, which is what drew thousands of people to him. I mean, he was the one who gave the speech in 1962, the very first tear down this wall. Stay, uh, came from him at Madison Square Garden in front of 18,000 people. He had a magnetism to him. He loved life. He loved quirkiness. But suddenly, the quirkiness started taking a new, uh, a, a new personality, and it started getting irrational and just not just unconventional, but uh, uh, irreconcilable. And he started making decisions that were just wrong. And Nothing, I mean, uh, buying things that he didn't need to buy, selling things he didn't need to sell, hiring people he didn't need to hire, uh, that, that sort of stuff. And eventually we, we realized there's something terribly, terribly wrong. It had just been discovered. Bipolarism had just been discovered. Um, and he was one of the earliest people this, uh, who was diagnosed as, as being bipolar. Uh, then it was called manic depression. Um, for the rest of his life, he mm -hmm. struggled with that. Uh, it, it is it is uh, an illness that I don't wish on my worst enemy, because not only when you're in a, <clears throat> a manic state can you not control what you're doing, but in his state, when he finally did come back to reality, he would be crushed by what he had done, and he had no it was through no fault <clears throat> of his own. Um, but the end of of the story is a is a is an incredible story, Bill. At the end of it, not only did the political not matter to him, but the activist Catholic didn't matter to him either. He became an extraordinary <clears throat> mystic who saw the world within a plane that very few people could reach. He wrote a book, Mustard Seeds. Um, the good luck trying to keep up with that book, um, to read that book. It is so deep. Uh, his thinking became so deep. And he, his idea of enjoyment was to go at six o'clock in the morning to downtown into, into deepest, darkest Washington, D.C., and serve breakfast to the poor. And that's what he would do, and that was his enjoyment. Or to go to Lorton Prison and talk to inmates. Um, that's what his life became about. He, all the trappings, all the luxuries were all set aside. He didn't care about any of it anymore. He died a third order Carmelite monk. I've always admired your sense of mission. And it seems like you didn't fall far from that, uh, that tree, the metaphorical tree. I mean, that's, uh, that's incredible. What did you, what do you personally take from his sense of, uh, Passion, devotion, spirituality. How do you? How does that guide you today? Courage, courage. He uh, he was unafraid, but 
it was more than being unafraid. He, he, he felt the, the moral, not just the moral certitude, but the moral obligation to say the things he did and, and to do the things he did. And if, and if he left me with something, it was that. Uh, it's, that sounds braggadocious. I don't mean that. But no, no, I, was, I, was, I brought it up. Yeah, I've observed you it in you. It, you've, got, you've got that. But you have to do <clears> that. You, you have to do that. And, and any time uh, <clears> I, 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 because, you know, in politics, sometimes you have to compromise. You know me, I hate compromising. Yeah, yeah, because you, you, yeah, <laughs> I'm not very good at it. You ought to see a tweet I put out this morning. You'll see how I'm not very good at it. Um, but, but, but that's what he taught me. He also, uh, it, it, was, it was pure love for anyone who knew him. Bill, if you, if you talk to, and, and there's still people around today who knew him, uh, and they'll all tell you the same thing. If there were 50 people in the room in a cocktail party and you walked in and he made eye contact with you, the other 49 didn't matter. He went right to you and he would talk right to you and get right inside your soul. And it would all be white noise all around you because you were talking to him. He could do that with anybody. And he meant it. He meant it. It didn't matter. He would go to you. He'd go to you. If he went to talk to you, the first thing he'd ask is, how are you? And he wanted to know all about your life. And you would open up to him and you would tell him everything. It was extraordinary. It was extraordinary what he could do. We talked about fusionism. What do you, what do you see as the state of fusionism today? I know you're working on a project to define uh, our so-called conservative movement in different terms. Well, I, I, I guess I'm... Not I'm, principles, but terms. Yeah, I'm, uh, well, the, the, I, I believe that it is time for conservatives to, uh, to, to think about the word conservative. Um, I don't think it sells anymore. As a matter of fact, I know it doesn't sell. And that's not a bad thing. The, the left went through the process in the late 1980s with the world, with the word liberalism. Uh, we had made it, on the right, we had made it so toxic that they knew they had to change it, and they became progressives. And today, they're progressives, and it was a very, very smart move on their part. Okay, if you look at the word conservative today and compare it to how it was in 1984, you'll see a remarkable sea change. In, in 1984, a plurality of Americans saw themselves as conservative. Uh, it was something, something like you know, 60%, 30% moderate, 10% liberal, something like that. Today, where young people are concerned, where the next generation is concerned, only 20% call themselves conservative. 80% of young people do not want to be seen as conservatives. And yet, when you look at it as a value proposition, they agree with us on issue after issue after issue. So the word conservative is getting in the way. So, so over the, since the election in 2020, I've been meeting with different groups of conservative leaders. You've been part of this um, to explore what do we need to do with the conservative movement? We've taken uh, national, massive national surveys. We've done focus group testing. Um, and we're launching, well, we, we are announcing next month, formally announcing, um, three new national organizations that are going to be launched. The word should not be conservative, not at this point. We are at an existential point in America's history. So this should be all about America, because it is all about America. The, 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 the strongest political force in America today is Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, they, they get their names on, on helmets. The Media Research Center doesn't get its names on football helmets. Uh, but what does Black Lives Matter believe? Well, it's run by Marxists, self-avowed, self-proclaimed Marx, Marxists, who have a manifesto that says, in black and white, their goal is to destroy the nuclear family. That is the core of Western, of other Judeo-Christian tradition. That's what they want. It's not that they're not just anti-America, they're anti-Western civilization. It's there for anyone to see. It's not proposed on making it up. So once upon a time, it was not appropriate to call somebody an American. George McGovern was the most left-wing United States <clears throat> senator, yet on July 4th, he waved an American flag. And it was simply wrong, and it was, it was, it was immoral, it was unethical to call him un-American or anti-American. Guess what? The left today, they are anti-American, and they proclaim their anti-Americanism. Fine. 
Let's have a debate. Are you for or against America? When you look at that from that standpoint, if you look at things from conservative v. liberal, it's a mishmash. If you think, look at things Democrat versus Republican, yawn. If you look at things American versus anti-American, we destroy the opposition. And that's where the fight should be. Define American. America. America is a process where, where freedom reigns in the Constitution. Let me, let me back up just a second to frame that a little differently, because when I, when I talk, uh, I love the, word, the phrase American exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And that's gotten pillory, that's gotten mischaracterized as what well, you're talking about, rich corporations and a strong, you know, and, a, and an aggressive military posture all over the world and basically the biggest bully in the block. So therefore, America is exceptional. No, mm -hmm. no, we're exceptional because of the ideas. And we're the only country that's really created itself right. based on a set of ideas and principles. And so I think when you're talking about America, you're really talking about those principles that people um, align with and agree about. Which is why we ought to talk about American exceptionalism. And we, we ought to restore it. You know, a, a, a great person uh, that we, we should remember at all times uh, <clears throat> was Rush Limbaugh because of his clear headedness. You know, this is a guy who had no formal education. Um, th this was a, a person who, who didn't read the great books, but he understood the world better than 99% of the people. You know, some people would say uh, he was just a, a throwaway. He was also a great friend of William F. Buckley uh, at his home. Bill adored him. You know, called him Rush Limbo. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but Rush had an insight into the world, and he would talk about American exceptionalism because he knew that yeah. it would strike a chord with Americans. He would talk about America as being the freest, most powerful nation in the world. Again, the left wants to tear down America. America, the left does not want America to be the most powerful nation in the world because they believe that's arrogance. Let's have a debate. Let's ask the American people, do you wish to be the strongest nation in the world or not be the strongest nation in the world? American exceptionalism means a virtuous society as well. We are a generous people. We are a kind people. Let's have a debate about that. The left says that America is a bad nation, that you're a bad person, I'm a bad person, you're a bad person, and the person we're talking to is a bad person. Let's have a debate about that. Let's, let's debate how generous America is, how good they are. I don't see Americans climbing over other walls. I see everyone else trying to get into America. There's a reason for it. Let's have a debate about it. Well, uh, that you are going to, what's, what's the name of the project you're going to roll out, or is it premature? It's going to be called the American Movement. It's as okay. simple as that. It's going to have a working war. It's going to be Our America <clears throat> is what you're going to see, but the corporate title is going to be the American Movement, because that's, that's what this is. And I want to have a discussion and a debate about America. How do we tie this into the book? Because I, 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 I don't want to be a gadfly a daydreamer. But I do want to be a dreamer. And I think that we as a nation need to become a, a, a nation of dreamers again because we are focused so much on the problems in society, the problems all around us, that we don't stop to think about a future. Not a future for us, but a future for our great-grandchildren. Is this a future where your children are going to be able to go to Spain by themselves and live by themselves in an apartment for three years and take care of everything by themselves, no communication across the pond for three years except for an occasional letter going back and forth? That's not today's world. But could you have a world of freedom? Could you have a world where you... you uh, why can't we have a world, Bill, where you don't have to lock your front door? Why can't you have that? Don't tell me you can't have that. But to get there, how do you get there? How do you make them, this, this a more noble society, a more free society? How do we make this where a black kid doesn't believe that by age 25 he's <clears throat> going to be in prison for the rest of his life, we're dead. How do we address that, the, the, the proper ways? We've got to think different ways, and we've got to be dreamers. So hopefully this book makes you dream a little bit. It made me dream a little bit about what, how much fun it must have been to grow up a Bozell. <laughs> how much trouble. <laughs> how much trouble. Well, we didn't. We avoided all that. We avoided the bars in in Spain and uh, some of yeah, your some was, of your extracurriculars. 
But, well, uh, when, when you don't have a drinking age in Spain and you don't have your parents and they're 3,000 miles away, things happen. You declared it was 14. Fort, well, no, 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 no. Spain came up with a new law saying at, uh, by the time we finished there, they came up with a law. It was the Bozell they said, law. They said, well, they said no one under 14. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ah, well, Red, this is this is great. I'm glad we could do this. And I've really stops along the way. I highly recommend it. And uh, we've got my great friend and great American, uh, Brent Bozell, has been with us. And we could talk about probably everything for the next 42 hours. But let's uh, we'll wrap this one up for today and we'll get you back on maybe talking about the American movement. Sure. Come sure. Out, Happy, roll to that out. Happy to do it. Happy to do it. Um, this has been the Bill Walton Show. I've been here with Brent Bozell, and you can find us, as always, on all the major podcast platforms, Rumble, YouTube, uh, Apple Music, uh, Spotify, on and on. We're also in America First on streaming on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Monday nights and also on Brent Bozell's platform for America, where we've got about 7 million impressions for the show. So uh, we're glad to be part of that. Good. So, Brent, thanks, and thanks, you all, for joining. Hey, tell me what that is, what you do. What, what, are, what, are, what are those? You're, you're following a certain pattern. This is my sketch pad, right? And I've been using this for three or four years. And it's, I do quadrants. I do first, second, third, fourth. And I used to be sort of rigid, like saying, okay, we're going to do segments here. We're going right. to say, um, this is going to be the first segment. Say, well, that's all out the window. Mm -hmm. Now it's just this wonderful sketch pad. But then I sometimes write down things here that I think are the key points, which would be courage. Huh. And uh, what I was else just have in there? By and, what then, you were and, doing. and then mustard seeds, because I've got a real penchant for mystical uh, thinking and, and people that want to be transcendent. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons your family story is so interesting. Your brother's in a monastery, mm -hmm. and it's just great. But I've got several. I'll send you the book. I get I've got a couple of these here, but then you can see I can go back here. This is George Will. We had on with John Tamney and uh, hmm. and uh, Don Bedreau. And uh, I don't think I would have had here. I think we talked about Bill of Rights. He wanted to get into trashing Trump, and I changed the subject because most everybody that watches yeah. this show likes sure, Trump. Sure, sure. Well, you started out not liking Trump and then decided you liked what he did as president. Yeah. He, he uh, well, well. I would, you know, I, I, I don't know if you know this, but I, offer, I, I met with, with uh, Sessions uh, during the summer of 2020. Yeah. And I offered to take a leave of absence from the MRC if doing something on the Trump campaign was more helpful than doing something with the MRC right. to, to do it. I, I thought I could leave it on autopilot for three months and help the Trump campaign. And uh, nothing come of it, came of it. And uh, it was like a two-hour meeting. But this campaign was a disaster. It was a disaster. It was a disaster. Arrogance and, you know, self-dealing. I mean, I don't think he paid enough attention to the stuff. And we told him that there were going to be issues with yeah. the mail-in ballots. I mean, it was just in February of 2020, March of 2020, when they changed all the rules about sending the ballots out, it was clear we were going to have... Um, you know, Katie, bar the door. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Want more? Click the subscribe button or head over to thebillwaltonshow.com to choose from over 100 episodes. You can also learn more about our guest on our Interesting People page. And send us your comments. We read everyone and your thoughts help us guide the show. If it's easier for you to listen, check out our podcast page and subscribe there. In return, We'll keep you informed about what's true, what's right, and what's next. Thanks for joining.